fun with uh, Elijah and the false prophets of Baal. If you remember, the prophets were dancing and leaping about trying to get the, uh, their uh, false god to respond, and uh, surprise, surprise, he didn't. And Elijah had a little bit of fun taunting them, suggesting, well, maybe he's asleep, he's gone for a stroll, he's using the restroom, whatever. Whatever was happening, he wasn't responding. But God did respond. God responded in an amazing and an abundant way. There had been three years of drought. It's a bit confusing because the reading that we heard this morning took place actually during that period of drought. Uh, and uh, as you saw again, um, God answered the prayer of Elijah in giving life to the child. And though it was in, in part amusing listening to all that was going on with that yes last week, the central theme was far from it. Elijah was horrified to see that the people of Israel were being tempted by false doctrines and turning away from their heritage and the commandments and experience of the one true God. And we also touch briefly on Paul's letter to the Galatians, and it's to that letter that I want to return this morning. Paul's letter to the church in Galatia gets straight to the point, dispensing with the usual customary greetings. He goes straight for it. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to another gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, what's happening here? Paul is referring to some of the Jewish evangelists who had moved into his turf, so to speak, and they're telling the, the non-Jewish converts in the church that accepting Christ is not enough. They must be circumcised as required by the Jewish law. Now, there may be some of you in the congregation who are quite relieved to know that, ple that Paul was vehemently opposed to this requirement. Not that Paul was opposed to circumcision in and of itself. His problem was that the motive behind the requirement of circumcision was all wrong. It was diametrically opposed to the meaning of Christ's cross and the freedom of grace. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, he wrote, but only faith working through love. And to those who preached that it was a requirement who unsettled the believers, he said, I wish that they would castrate themselves. It's a line that my husband particularly likes. <laughs> but Paul's letter was not just about whether or not pagan believers should be circumcised. As N.T. Wright uh, describes, the question was, how do you define the people of God? Are they to be defined by badges of Jewish race or in some other way? This was a new thing. The church was, was trying to organize itself. What does it mean? What does this mean? Those badges of Jewish race would include circumcision, yes, but also what food one ate, who one ate it with, a myriad of things. Indeed, Paul says, you can't just pick and choose here. If you're going to follow the law, then you must follow it completely. Adhere to the law or not. And he said that they don't need to. They don't need to adhere to any of the Jewish law in order to be included in the Abrahamic faith. For he wrote, God established the family of Abraham and all those in Christ belong whatever their racial background. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. He says you are either the slave or you are free. You are heirs or you are slaves. You please God or you please man. Which will it be? Paul, as you know, and as he points out to us in the reading from Galatians this morning, was advanced in Judaism beyond many among people of his own age. He says, I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors, violently persecuting the church of God and trying to destroy it. But then Paul had an encounter with the Christ Jesus. An encounter, he says, that did not come from human teaching, 
but was a revelation of Jesus Christ. And that revelation established him, he said, as an apostle, though some would say that he, he wasn't really. But you see, he had lived under the law, and now he understood about grace. So he was more than qualified to speak. The revelation from Christ did not stop him from being the Jew that he was born. But now he understood. He understood that the Jewish expectation of a Messiah was dramatically different from the Christ that he had encountered on that road to Damascus. It was Jesus Christ who walked the earth, who was crucified and rose again, that Paul preached with such passion and conviction. And he was furious that there were others who were confusing and wanted to pervert, he said, the gospel of Christ. He argued that they were saying, in effect, that Christ, what Christ had done was not sufficient. It was not enough. No, says Paul, no. You are a new creation. This is something completely new. You've been made new in Christ by God's grace, not by your works, not by anything that you could do. There's nothing that you can add. So what difference does it make? What difference does it make to us 21st century Episcopalians sitting in the pew this morning in Warrington? Some of you have told me that you were born Episcopalians. You never strayed far from the church. But others, myself included, there was a time, a long time, when faith was a very long way off. I was a particularly stubborn case, you see. I had little time for the church or church goers when I was younger. I had very high expectations of Christians, and in my not very humble opinion, church goers did not meet those expectations. I painted all Christians with the same brush. They're all like that, whatever that was. Whatever it was, it didn't reach my lofty standards. I thought it was rule-driven, you see. I thought it was rule-driven, not love-based. But then when I got to know people who went to church, I started to worry that I didn't come up to their standards. And then when I made my commitment to Christ, I worried that I didn't come up to Christ's standards. A worry which in my weaker moments, I still think persists. I'm a worrier, can you tell? <laughs> Am I doing enough? Am I praying enough? Am I tithing enough? Am I forgiving enough? So easy to fall into that trap forgetting that his grace is sufficient. And I think we know what St. Paul would say about that. He might say that, he might say that. <laughs> I have a, new, a granddaughter, as most of you know, so I'm used to pauses. A couple of weeks ago, I received a letter from someone who gave me some of the reasons why she could not accept Christ. Blind faith, she called it, open to ridicule, believing in something you can neither prove nor deny. She wrote, one only has to look at the many horrific cults that are always around, and it's always based upon people being drawn in and blindly believing against all odds. She said, I'm extremely nervous around any group of people talking about Christianity. I'll quickly move away so as not to be seen as part of the group. I can understand. I can understand. It's not a very flattering description, is it? See, my friend has yet to do, encounter the grace of Christ, the grace-filled love of Christ. What she sees is his less than perfect followers. But it was the last line, it was the last line that stood out for me. She wrote, if anyone needed a faith, it would be me, but I'm also the last person to do it because nothing could ever convince me I was worth it. And that's the part that tears at the heart, isn't it? And there's a lot of people that feel like that. Maybe there's people here that feel like that. I'm not worth it. A belief that she'll never be good enough for Christ's love, that she'll never come up to what she 
thinks God needs before he gives that love. If only she understood that she didn't have to earn it. St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe we all need to hear that sometimes, don't we? How can I persuade my friend that she is loved, that there is nothing that can separate her from that love? But isn't it something we all need to hear? My words may not, may not make a difference. My prayers might, and the Spirit of God certainly can. Now, I know that the problem with the church in Galatia was probably less about feeling unworthy and more about wanting to do whatever it takes to be acceptable and accepted. But accepted by whom? Looking back at the beginning of the first chapter of Galatians, we remember Paul writes, I'm astonished you are so quickly deserting the one. Some translations say deserting him. He's talking about the person of Jesus Christ. This is not about following Paul. It's about following Jesus. Feeling unworthy and acceptable all imply that Jesus didn't do enough. His grace is insufficient. Paul says loud and clear, his grace is enough. His grace is enough. So does that mean that all those who follow Christ are free to do whatever we like because we're covered, right? We have an insurance policy. Paul had some things to say about that too. And later in the letter to Galatians, he, he talks about some of the sins that we must avoid repeating without remorse. See, we are accountable because the Spirit of God is within us. We are urged to seek the Spirit's guidance, to point out those weaknesses, to confess them. So that what is good, the fruit of the Spirit, will shine through us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I don't know about you, but I have a long way to go. But it's not to earn God's approval. And that's the point. That's why it matters. When we realize how unworthy we are and the humility of the one who took it all on himself, it is done. And so our, what we do is in response to that love that's been poured out on us. We have some wonderful praise hymns that we have sung and will be singing today. One hymn that spe especially speaks to me on this. My song is love unknown. My Savior's love for me. Love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? Amen. <laughs>